Okay, welcome. So this is another in the series of reflections on passages in Savitri. And the title of this talk is The Symbol Dawn. So in this presentation, we'll examine the opening passage of Savitri in the first canto, which is titled The Symbol Dawn. And the opening of the poem is sometimes considered one of the most difficult parts of Savitri to understand. For here, we're introduced to a very unusual mystical poetry with a multi-leveled symbol of the dawn. At one level, it is a description of the dawn on the day in which the main action of the poem occurs. But this outer significance of the physical dawn is only the most superficial sense of the dawn that is described here. It also represents the dawning of light in the darkness at the origin of the universe. The periodic openings of our darkened material consciousness to higher levels of consciousness and eventually to the spiritual light and its influence. Also, the advent of the divine consciousness in the world through the avatar, the incarnation of the divine being. And finally, the advent of a new stage in the evolution of consciousness on earth, the advent of the supermental consciousness and a higher divine being embodied on earth. Only some of these deeper significances are spelled out or foreshadowed here, but all are further developed in later parts of the poem. So we'll consider some of these deeper significances of the dawn as expressed in the poem, in the passage, and in other related writings. Before beginning with an examination of the passage, we should mention that Sri Aurobindo did not invent this symbol of the dawn. He discovered its use already in the ancient Rig Veda. And in his translation and interpretation of a particular passage in the secret of the Veda, he writes the following. This is the straightforward and natural sense of the hymn and its intention is not difficult to follow if we remember the main ideas and images of the Vedic doctrine. The night is clearly the image of an inner darkness. By the coming of the dawn, the truths are one out of the night. This is the rising of the sun, which was lost in the obscurity the familiar figure of the lost sun recovered by the gods and the Angaras Rishis, the sun of truth, and it now shoots out its tongue of fire towards the golden light, for Hiranya, gold, is the concrete symbol of the higher light, the gold of the truth, and it is this treasure not golden coin for which the Vedic rishis pray to the gods. As here the golden light is mentioned, we may note that for Sri Aurobindo, the golden light represents the light of the supermental truth. For example, in one of his letters on yoga, he writes, the golden light is the light of the divine truth which comes out from the supramental sunlight and modified according to the level it crosses, creates the ranges from overmind to higher mind. And further down in the passage from the secret of the Veda, Sri Aurobindo concludes, we shall see that not only in this hymn, but everywhere, Dawn comes as a bringer of the truth, is herself the outshining of the truth. She is the divine dawn, and the physical dawning is only her shadow and symbol 
in the material universe. And in another explanation of several related key passages or re several related key symbols in the Veda, Sri Aurobindo says, we have had reason to conclude that Usha is the divine dawn and not merely the physical, that her cows or rays of the dawn and the sun are the illuminations of the dawning divine consciousness and that therefore the sun is the illuminer in the sense of the Lord of knowledge and that Swar the solar world beyond heaven and earth is the world of the divine truth and bliss. In a word, that light in the Veda is the symbol of knowledge, of the illumination of the divine truth. And in view of these commentaries on the Vedic symbols of the dawn and sun and light, we can also remind ourselves of Sri Aurobindo's explanation of the symbolic significance of the character Savitri in the author's note at the start of the epic. He says, Savitri is the divine word, daughter of the sun, goddess of the supreme truth, who comes down and is born to save. And regarding the form of the opening passage, a well-known commentator on the poem, M. V. Nadkarni, notes that the passage describes the, da the dawn in several phases, each phase of which is about 30 lines. Thus, the presentation will cover the first 185 lines of Savitri, which describes six phases of the dawn the last phase including a brief transition to the next section. So let's now read the first part of the passage describing this first phase and follow with a commentary. It was the hour before the gods awake. Across the path of the divine event the huge foreboding mind of night alone in her unlit temple of eternity lay stretched immobile upon silence marge. Almost one felt opaque, impenetrable in the somber symbol of her eyeless muse the abysm of the unbodied infinite. A fathomless zero occupied the world. A power of fallen, boundless self awake between the first and the last nothingness recalling the tenebrous womb from which it came turned from the insoluble mystery of birth and the tardy process of mortality and longed to reach its end in vacant naught. As in a dark beginning of all things, a mute, featureless semblance of the unknown repeating forever the unconscious act, prolonging forever the unseeing will, cradled the cosmic drowse of ignorant force, whose moved creative slumber kindles the suns and carries our lives in its somnambulist whirl. Athwart the vain, enormous trance of space, its formless 
stupor without mind or life, a shadow spinning through a soulless void, thrown back once more into unthinking dreams, earth wheeled abandoned in the hollow gulfs, forgetful of her spirit and her fate. The impassive skies were neutral, empty, still. Several authoritative commentaries on Savitri, including Amal Kiran, who I quote here, have pointed out that the first line, it was the hour before the gods awake, pertains to the Brahmo Mohurta, Mohurta, the time when the temple bells ring in order to mark the symbolic, symbolic moment for the powers of light to resume their workings. He notes that the lines, the huge foreboding mind of night, alone in her unlit temple of eternity, further stresses this interpretation. And another commentator, Nadkarni, also says that he is describing the Brahma Muhurta when in South India, the Pujaris ring the temple bells for the first time. The belief is that the gods of the various powers who keep this world in harmony, there is a god for rain, there is a god for wind, all of these various gods in the occult world are supposed to retire and then resume early in the morning. And I would note that the use of the past tense was and then the present tense, awake, in the line, also suggests that this refers to a particular day of a recurring phenomenon of when the gods awake. It is not until we reach the last line of the canto that we discover which particular day this dawn pertains to. This was the day when Satyavan must die. Otherwise, and suggested by much of the passage above, the first line could equally well be taken to pertain to the origin of the universe when there was just inconscient force or matter, a complete absence of consciousness. And this interpretation is reinforced by lines such as the abysm, of the unbodied infinite. A fathomless zero occupied the world and as in a dark beginning of all things. And towards the end of this part of the passage, we find described an ignorant movement of physical energy as in the lines cradled the cosmic drowse of ignorant force, whose moved creative slumber kindles the suns and carries our lives in its somnambulist whirl. And this last line links this inconscient beginning of all things to us in the present time who are still moved and carried by this inconscient force as if we were sleepwalking. Still, although the passage links the inconscient beginning to our own present lives, this part of the passage generally appears focused on this inconscient beginning, as in the concluding line, the impassive skies were neutral empty, still. 
So this suggests that there are at least two levels of meaning for this dawn, one pertaining to the origin of creation and one pertaining to the momentous day in which Satyavan must die. The second and third lines, across the path of the divine event, the huge foreboding mind of night alone also suggests a different interpretation. The words divine event could be taken in the sense of the beginning of the material universe out of the inconscience, but they also suggest some type of divine manifestation, which is reinforced with the capitalization of the word event. This could be a manifestation of spiritual light, or it could be a manifestation of a divine being on earth in the form of an avatar. For those familiar with Sri Aurobindo's primary yogic aims, it may also suggest the manifestation of the supermind and the advent of a higher race of beings on earth, the superman. This manifestation of an all-knowing and all-powerful consciousness on earth was the event, the primary mission towards which he and the mother labored. And across the path suggests an obstacle is blocking this divine event. And this obstacle is the huge foreboding mind of night. Just as the dawn is an apt symbol of the increasing manifestation of spiritual light, the night is a symbol of spiritual darkness. But here, this spiritual darkness is conscious. It is a mind of night, and it is threatening, ominous, foreboding. And again, for those familiar with Sri Aurobindo's yoga, it brings to mind a hostile or anti-divine being who seeks to prevent or delay as long as possible the outbreak of spiritual light in the world, and especially the advent of a manifestation of the supermental consciousness on earth, which would mean the end of its rule over earthly life. And as we'll see much later in the poem, the mind of night will express itself quite eloquently through the words of the god of death to Savitri. Savitri, who armed with the divine's omnipotent power, is an incarnation of the divine mother who has come to bring spiritual deliverance to earth and mankind. In fact, at one point, the god Death is referred to as the voice of night. So let's move on to the next phase of the dawn. Then something in the inscrutable darkness stirred, a nameless movement, an unthought idea, insistent, dissatisfied, without an aim, something that wished but knew not how to be, tease the inconscient to wake ignorance. A throw that came and left a quivering trace gave room for an old tired want unfilled, at peace, in its subconscient, moonless cave, to raise its head and look for absent light, straining closed eyes of vanished memory, like one who searches for a bygone self and only meets the corpse of his desire. It was as though even in this knots profound, 
even in this ultimate dissolution's core, there lurked an unremembering entity, survivor of a slain and buried past, condemned to resume the effort and the pain, reviving in another frustrate world. An unshaped consciousness desired light, and a blank prescience yearned towards distant change. As if a childlike finger laid on a cheek, reminded of the endless need in things, the heedless mother of the universe, an infant longing clutched the somber vast. Insensibly, somewhere, a breach began, a long, lone line of hesitating hue, like a vague smile tempting a desert heart, troubled the far rim of life's obscure sleep. Here, the outer symbol of the physical dawn is thrust aside almost completely, and we're confronted with a state of the original inconscience slowly waking up to self-awareness. For a physical dawn has no wishes or unfulfilled wants. Though if we wish to keep the outer symbol, we can take it to describe somebody who is waking, beginning to wake up in this early dawn. In Sri Aurobindo's view, even inconscient matter and force has hidden within it a secret consciousness. This is why, even though outwardly unconscious, it operates infallibly and follows the laws of physical nature and gradually reveals, through the long process of evolution, the consciousness that is hidden within it. In time, it manifests living matter, forms of life that, are, that themselves, over time, evolve and become more complex living beings, which eventually reveal a complex mental consciousness. In this portion of the passage of Savitri, we see described the first stirring of consciousness in inconscient matter, which awakens to a state of ignorance. It still is barely awake and is straining towards light and a memory of self that is towards self-awareness. And also suggested here is that this awakening is not happening for the first time. He says, even in this ultimate dissolution's core, there lurked an unremembering entity, survivor of a slain and buried past, condemned to resume the effort and the pain, reviving in another frustrate world. There is an old tradition that there have been a series of creations out of inconscience, which again, after a long awakening, fall back into inconscience, into praleya, as it's called. This consciousness that is just beginning to regain self-awareness is eternal. It persists even through the collapse of the creation into absolute darkness and inconscience. It moves between absolute non-self-awareness and absolute self-awareness, between inconscient matter and all-conscious spirit. 
and in between are revealed all the levels and variations of consciousness, which we call the creation, but are really infinite manifestations of the one being and its consciousness and force. And at the end of this portion of the passage, there are painted two interesting images. This first stirring of consciousness is likened to an infant's finger touching the cheek of its mother, which reminds her of the much that must be done. And here it is not just any mother, but the mother of the universe who has yet to manifest its eonic evolution and diversity of beings and growing consciousnesses. The infant who is longing for something, perhaps it does not know for what, perhaps for all that it does not yet have or know what it must eventually become, clutches the somber vast the vast dark ignorance that surrounds it, seeking for self-awareness and fulfillment. This stirring of consciousness in the inconscious, the seeking for light, creates an opening for the light to enter. We may also take it as a symbol of our own seeking for light and spiritual fulfillment, which also has its effect of opening the consciousness to the light. A breach then began, a break in the darkness opened to a long thin line of colored light which seemed like a vague smile, tempting a desolate heart to hope and happiness. This opening to light was still very faint and hesitating, as if at the far edge of the black night. But it creates a stir, a disturbance in the darkness. And the next portion of the passage marks a dramatic change in the progress of the dawn and in the perspective from which it is represented. Arrived from the other side of boundlessness, an eye of deity peered through the dumb deeps a scout in a reconnaissance from the sun. It seemed amid a heavy cosmic rest, the torpor of a sick and weary world, to seek for a spirit, soul and desolate, too fallen to recollect forgotten bliss. Intervening, in a mindless universe, its message crept through the reluctant hush, calling the adventure of consciousness and joy and conquering nature's disillusioned breast, compelled renewed consent to see and feel. A thought was sown in the unsounded void. A sense was born within the darkness depths. A memory quivered in the heart of time, as if a soul long dead were moved to live but the oblivion that succeeds the fall had blotted the crowded tablets of the past, and all that was destroyed must be rebuilt, and old experience labored out once more. All can be done 
if the God touch is there. A hope stole in that hardly dared to be amid the night's forlorn indifference. As if solicited in an alien world with timid and hazardous instinctive grace, orphaned and driven out to seek a home, an errant marvel with no place to live, into a far-off nook of heaven there came a slow, miraculous gesture's dim appeal, the persistent thrill of a transfiguring touch persuaded the inert black quietude and beauty and wonder disturbed the fields of God. The first sentence identifies the first light of the dawn with a deity from the other side of boundlessness, peering into the darkness, seeking for a spirit, soul, and desolate, too fallen to recollect forgotten bliss. And further, this deity brings a message calling the adventure of consciousness and joy and conquering nature's disillusioned breast, compelled renewed consent to see and feel. These lines link the symbol more firmly to the Vedic symbol of the dawn, which is represented by the goddess Usha. But in the Veda itself, Usha is represented as a form or power of the Divine Mother of Aditi. Specifically, Sri Aurobindo says, Usha as the mother of the cows. Sri Aurobindo says cow is a Vedic symbol for the physical light or for spiritual illumination. Can only be a form or power of this supreme light, of this supreme consciousness of Aditi. And in fact, we do find her so described, mother of the gods, form or power of Aditi. Thus, this image of the deity peering into the darkness also links the dawn to Savitri herself, who Sri Aurobindo has said represents an incarnation of the Divine Mother mother of the universe, mentioned in the previous portion of the passage, as being reminded of the endless need in things by her infant touching her cheek. This original dawn at the start of the universe seems to describe the first incarnation of the Divine Mother into the universe, while Savitri is a later incarnation. Of course, here it is just an eye of deity that is peering into the darkness. But later in the passage, we'll see that the goddess actually enters into it. And due to this initial action of the deity peering into the darkness of the primordial creation, seeking for a spirit, to fall into recollect forgotten bliss and calling the adventure of consciousness and joy, a thought was sown in the unsounded void. A sense was born within the darkness depths. A memory quivered in the heart of time as if a soul long dead were moved to live. The Divine Mother planted a seed of thought and sense and hope into the world, moving the soul to wake up and live and seek for joy. If it were not for this intervention of the Divine Mother, the evolution of consciousness in inconscient matter 
would not have happened. It could not have emerged out of the darkness, out of the oblivion that succeeds the fall, as Sri Aurobindo put it. For that oblivion had blotted the crowded tablets of the past, and all that was destroyed must be rebuilt, and old experience labored out once more. The consciousness of the spirit had been abolished in the fall into inconscience. It had to be laboriously rebuilt, one small step after another, in the eons long process of evolution. But due to this intervention, this sowing of the seed of consciousness and joy into the heart of matter by the Divine Mother, this gradual growth and flowering of spirit in matter became not only possible, but inevitable. All can be done if the God touches there. The seed of consciousness and joy is the soul. It has been put into matter by the mother and is a portion of her. It is this that grows in the course of evolution through many lives and in many forms, in plant, an animal, and man, through an infinite variety of experiences, gradually molding and organizing the forms and forces which it inhabits, assimilating them and growing by them. It is eternal and pure and divine. Death cannot touch it, the ignorance and evil of the world or of the forms in which it dwells cannot stop its growth and eventual flowering. The last three lines describe the initial result of this intervention. The persistent thrill of a transfiguring touch persuaded the inert black quietude, and beauty and wonder disturb the fields of God. The next part of the passage vividly and eloquently describes the outburst of the dawn's light in incomparable poetry, though again it bears repeating that the earthly physical dawn is but a symbol of an original dawn at the beginning of creation and the outbreak of spiritual light. A wandering hand of pale enchanted light that glowed along a fading moment's brink fixed with gold panel and opalescent hinge, a gate of dreams, a jar on mystery's verge. One lucent corner windowing hidden things forced the world's blind immensity to sight. The darkness failed and slipped like a falling cloak from the reclining body of a god. Then through the pallid rift that seemed at first hardly enough for a trickle from the suns, outpoured the revelation and the flame. The brief perpetual sign recurred above a glamour from unreached transcendences, iridescent with the glory of the unseen, a message from the unknown immortal light, a blaze upon creation's quivering edge. Dawn built her aura of magnificent hues, 
and buried its seed of grandeur in the hours. An instant's visitor the God had shown. On life's thin border a while the vision stood and bent over earth's pondering forehead curve, interpreting a recondite beauty and bliss in colors hieroglyphs of mystic sense. It wrote the lines of a significant myth, telling of a greatness of spiritual dawns, a brilliant code penned with the sky for page. The first line here, a wandering hand of pale enchanted light, carries forward the earlier image of a miraculous gesture's dim appeal and the persistent thrill of a transfiguring touch and also links the image to the action of a goddess. The goddess's hand was fixing, rigging or fastening a gate of dreams with a gold panel and an opalescent hinge, which was a jar slightly open. And this opening was like a lucent or transparent corner, providing a window to the hidden things beyond. The light of the beyond passing through this window forced the blind, forced the world's blind immensity to sight, and the darkness failed and slipped like a falling cloak from the reclining body of a god, which is a wonderful image of the receding darkness of both the physical night and the spiritual night. And suddenly, the slight opening, which at first was hardly enough for a trickle from the sun, gave way and there burst forth the revelation and the flame. This also reflects how a simple and transient spiritual experience can develop into a deeper and permanent realization. And next, Sri Aurobindo describes this outburst of light as a glamour from unreached transcendences that were iridescent or shimmering with the glory of the unseen. He then describes it as a message from the unknown immortal light, a blaze upon creation's quivering edge. And next he says that dawn built her aura of magnificent hues, which because of the verb built again suggests it was the goddess dawn building her aura and buried its seed of grandeur in the hours. It was as if the goddess dawn at the beginning of creation planted a seed of itself in time such that it would periodically recur on each passing day. This aura of magnificent hues was an instant's visitor. It lasted only a few moments on life's thin border bent over earth's pondering forehead curve. These magnificent colors were like hieroglyphs a mystical writing interpreting a hidden divine beauty and bliss and telling a significant myth about the greatness of spiritual dawns yet to come. 
in a brilliant code penned with the sky for page. It is as if each morning we are being reassured by the magnificence of the dawn that the light of the divine is coming and that this darkness will end. The passage continues. Almost that day the epiphany was disclosed, of which our thoughts and hopes are signal flares. A lonely splendor from the invisible goal almost was flung on the opaque inane. Once more a tread perturbed the vacant vast. Infinity's center, a face of rapturous calm, parted the eternal lids that open heaven. A form from far beatitudes seemed to near. Ambassadress twixt eternity and change. The omniscient goddess leaned across the breaths that wrapped the faded journeyings of the stars and saw the spaces ready for her feet. Once she half looked behind for her veiled son, then thoughtful went to her immortal work. Earth felt the imperishable's passage close. The waking ear of nature heard her steps, and wideness turned to her its limitless eye. And, scattered on sealed depths, her luminous smile kindled to fire the silence of the worlds. All grew a consecration and a rite. Air was a vibrant link between earth and heaven. The wide-winged hymn of a great priestly wind arose and failed upon the altar hills. The high boughs prayed in a revealing sky. Here where our half-lit ignorance skirts the gulfs, on the dumb bosom of the ambiguous earth, here where one knows not even the step in front, and truth has her throne on the shadowy back of doubt, on this anguished and precarious field of toil, outspread beneath some large, indifferent gaze, impartial witness of our joy and bale, our prostrate soil bore the awakening ray. Here, too, the vision and prophetic gleam lit into miracles, common, meaningless shapes. The first sentence here stresses with two instances of the word almost, that this original breaking out of the dawn's light while resplendent did not fully reveal the divine light in the opaque inane, the dark emptiness. But then, infinity's center a face of rapturous calm parted the eternal lids that open heaven. A form from far beatitude seemed to near, ambassadress twixt eternity and change. The omniscient goddess leaned across the breadths that wrapped the faded journeyings of the stars and saw the spaces ready for her feet. Again, we're confronted with a 
divine goddess, who from a heaven of far beatitudes enters into the darkness of the physical universe. This is surely the goddess Dawn, but as we have seen in Sri Aurobindo's explanation of the goddess Usha in the Veda, she is a form of Aditi, the Divine Mother. And the description of her as ambassadress twixt eternity and change is particularly suggestive of the Divine Mother. For example, in the book, The Mother, describing the original Supreme Shakti, Sri Aurobindo writes, she stands above the worlds and links the creation to the ever unmanifest mystery of the Supreme. And there comes next a wonderful image. Once she half looked behind for her veiled son, then thoughtful went to her immortal work. We remember that Sri Aurobindo says that in the Vedic symbolism, Savitri is the daughter of the sun, goddess of the supreme truth who comes down and is born to save. This is her immortal work. And as the goddess approaches, nature responds to her divine presence. Her luminous smile kindled to fire the silence of the worlds. And all grew a consecration and a rite. One of the remarkable things about Sri Aurobindo's poetry is his perception and expression of the divine in nature. We see it expressed throughout the poem in his vivid descriptions of nature and the seasons and in this canto of the dawn. And in the following sentence, he expresses this presence of the divine in nature, put there by the goddess, so simply and yet so eloquently. Air was a vibrant link between earth and heaven, the wide-winged hymn of a great priestly wind arose and failed upon the altar hills. The high boughs prayed in a revealing sky. And while humanity has lost the simplicity and purity of material nature, it too bears the impress of the descending goddess. The description of our fallen state is simple, devastating, and yet compassionate. Here, where our half-lit ignorance skirts the gulfs, on the dumb bosom of the ambiguous earth, here where one knows not even the step in front, and truth has her throne on the shadowy back of doubt, on this anguished and precarious field of toil, outspread beneath some large, indifferent gaze, impartial witness of our joy and bale. Our prostrate soil bore the awakening ray. In our fallen state, assailed by ignorance and doubt. We hardly sense this divine presence in nature. We live and toil and suffer beneath some large indifferent gaze, which seems to us a nature even more unconscious than ourselves. But as Sri Aurobindo says, even though, even so, our prostrate soil bore the awakening ray. Human beings too were awakened, if yet only a little, 
and lit into miracles. Then the divine afflatus spent, withdrew, unwanted, fading from the mortal's range. A sacred yearning lingered in its trace, the worship of a presence and a power too perfect to be held by death-bound hearts. The prescience of a marvelous birth to come. Only a little the godlight can stay. Spiritual beauty illumining human sight lines with its passion and mystery matters mask and squanders eternity on a beat of time. As when a soul draws near the sill of birth, adjoining mortal time to timelessness, a spark of deity lost in matter's crypt, its luster vanishes in the inconscient planes. That transitory glow of magic fire, so now dissolved in bright accustomed air. The message ceased and waned the messenger. The single call, the uncompanioned power drew back into some far-off secret world. The hue and marvel of the supernal beam, she looked no more on our mortality. The excess of beauty natural to Godkind could not uphold its claim on time-born eyes. Too mystic real, for space tenancy. Her body of glory was expunged from heaven. The rarity and wonder lived no more. There was the common light of earthly day. A franchise from the respite of fatigue, once more the rumor of the speed of life pursued the cycles of her blinded quest. All sprang to their unvarying daily acts, the thousand peoples of the soil and tree, obeyed the unforeseeing instant's urge. And leader here with his uncertain mind, alone who stares at the future's covered face, man lifted up the burden of his fate. In this final segment of the passage, the goddess of the dawn withdraws. And it's interesting how Sri Aurobindo puts it, then the divine afflatus spent, withdrew, unwanted, fading from the mortal's range. And the flatus is a divine imparting of knowledge or power and inspiration. It was spent. It had given its all, but it was unwanted. This one word, unwanted, sums up the tragedy of human existence. The divine is here, above us, all around us, in us, and is ready to give itself to us so that we may be taken up into, its, into it in glorious union. But we don't want it. We prefer our little comforts and pleasures and pains, our little independent lives. Sri Aurobindo once put it like this, 
all would change if man could once consent to be spiritualized. But his nature, mental and vital and physical, is rebellious to the higher law. He loves his imperfections. So the, divine, the dawn's miraculous beauty fades away. In its trace, its aftermath, a sacred yearning lingered. The worship of a presence and a power too perfect to be held by death-bound hearts. We may feel the sacred presence and power of the divine. We may worship it, but it is too perfect for us. We do not fully embrace it. We do not fully give ourselves to it. We keep it at a distance, as in a high heaven or in the inner sanctum of the temple where we may worship it from a safe distance. Still, Sri Aurobindo calls it the prescience of a marvelous birth to come. Prescience is foreknowledge or a foresight. This dawn is a sign of the greater spiritual dawns that are yet to come. It reaffirms what he said earlier in his description of the dawn. It wrote the lines of a significant myth telling of a greatness of spiritual dawns. A brilliant code penned with the sky for page. And the next sentence is interesting. Only a little the God light can stay. Spiritual beauty illumining human sight lines with its passion and mystery matters mask and squanders eternity on a beat of time. We wonder why the avatars, the rishis, saints, and seers come and go and seem to make so little difference in our humanity. And here he tells us that each of these repeated short visitations of the God light lines with its passion and mystery matters mask. Our material nature, matters mask, cannot be easily or quickly <coughs> transformed into a luminous, conscious, divine substance. It must be gradually molded, kneaded, lined, the divine comes with its eternal consciousness and squanders it, spends it lavishly on our brief mortal existence. And it reminds me of a recent conversation I had with an Aurovillian who had had the darshan of the mother and who had lived many years in Auroville. And with tears in his eyes, he spoke of his gratitude to the mother for giving him this life, a gratitude which brought with it deep happiness. And perhaps most who are called into this path, who are touched or carried along by the grace of Sri Aurobindo and the Mother, may sometimes wonder, why me? Who am I? What did I do to deserve their attention? their love, their generosity. The divine in its infinite love and grace squanders it, pours it so abundantly on our apparently undeserving lives. And in the next sentence, Sri Aurobindo describes the fading of the dawn's marvel using the analogy 
of a soul leaving its heavenly home and descending into a material body for another earthly life where its luster vanishes in the inconscient planes. Similarly, that transitory glow of magic fire, so now dissolved in bright, accustomed air. He concludes the image by saying, her body of glory was expunged from heaven. The rarity and wonder lived no more. There was the common light of earthly day. The magical, changing, colored light of the dawn faded into common daylight. And the passage concludes with two sentences which transition to the next section of the canto, which will begin with the line, And Savitri too awoke among these tribes. Coming immediately after this elaborate description of the dawn, this first line of the new section links Savitri with the goddess dawn. In these transition lines, Sri Aurobindo says that in this common light of earthly day, the rumor of the speed of life pursued the cycles of her blinded quest. He then elaborates on this blinded quest. All sprang to their unvarying daily acts, the thousand peoples of the soil and tree, obeyed the unforeseeing instant's urge. These thousand peoples presumably refer to animals, for people do not generally live in trees. But then in the last part of the sentence, he describes human beings. And leader here with his uncertain mind, alone who stares at the future's covered face, man lifted up the burden of his fate. Unlike the animals who are unforeseeing, human beings stare at the future's covered face. And that is a great part of the burden of our fate. We can foresee death, but what death is and what it will bring are hidden from our sight. And so it was for Savitri. Thank you.